Mr. McCoy back with part seven of Miss Hickory. As you recall, Miss Hickory went over once more to the Ladies' Aid Society. As soon as they saw her, they began clucking, arguing among themselves. Hush up, she told them. This is no time to think of yourselves. Winter has lasted long enough, and if anything we can do, we'll break it. Let us do it. And with that, she filled both hands with yellow kernels of dried corn from the hen pheasant's pile. Come on, she ordered. So each timid hen took a kernel of corn in her bill. One at a time, their president leading, they walked in a line from behind Miss Hickory, away from their shelter, across high mowing, until they came to the place where Groundhog slept. They knew that it was his hole, where they could hear his deep and regular snores. Spread the corn in front of his door, Sickery told them. Then run. They laid a square meal of corn in front of Groundhog's hole. Miss Hickory rapped loudly on his door and they all scattered but watched from a safe distance. Groundhog's snores subsided. He stirred, unrolled himself, and they saw his homely face with shifty black eyes appear cautiously out. Then he came entirely out and pounced upon the corn, eating it greedily. He looked hither and yon, and since it was a dark day, he saw no shadow. He closed his door and walked warily away from his hole, gnawing at the greening bushes that were pushing through the snow. Spring is coming, Miss Hickory exclaimed. Spring is coming, in Pheasant's chorus, looking toward the woods where Cock Pheasant and the other husbands had spent the winter. As for Groundhog, he did not return to his hole. He watched to see when the spring plowing would begin. He made no effort to return the food he had been given. One could not tell whether he knew that he was a weather prophet, but the fact remained that he was. What does it mean when it says that uh, the Groundhog is a weather prophet? Share your interpretation with your fellow listener. A loud rushing of wings, a dark shadow across the sun like an eclipse, loud mouth talk in the tops of the pine trees. So the crows returned. Now in March it was old crow week. The young ones of the season before had grown as tough and noisy as their parents. The old ones, those in rusty black with worn tails and cracked voices, called harsh bass notes in the chorus. There was still frost in the ground, snow lay in patches, and the brooks were roofed with a thin layer of the winter's ice. But there was a change in the scene, a promise of spring in the air. Miss Hickory felt it in her twigs as from the lookout of her nest she watched the doings of Old Crow Week. Not that she approved, oh no. And because one of the big shaggy birds looked exactly like every other one, she could not discover Crow among his fellows. He isn't here yet, she said to herself. Then, as the flock with hoarse calls of delight plunged down among the frightened hens of the Ladies' Aid Society, gobbling their corn and sending the timid fowls scuttling away to safety, Miss Hickory thought, Crow is not here, I know. He isn't a bully and a thief. But it was fascinating, she found, to watch the celebration from her lofty point of view. After they had stolen a large dinner, next on their program came the crow's battles for nests. All winter their great nests built of loosely placed branches in the tops of the pine trees and withstood the weather. Any self-respecting bird would want to build himself a new nest when he came back, but not the crows. With flapping wings and stabbing bills, they fought for the old ones. Only those who could not steal a nest started off for building materials. And as soon as a crow left the nest, the fight began all over again. Then, as the nests were finally patrolled by crow police, a committee headed by the toughest, noisiest crow of all began staking out claims. They boldly walked along behind plows and with their great yellow feet made marks on the edges of the fields where corn would be planted. Little ground maps discernible from a tree only to a crow's sharp eyes. They left young crow scouts near truck gardens to watch for the first planting and to report when young beans, peas, and asparagus could be nipped. And always the head man of the scouting committee urged them on to map more fields and gardens, calling raucous important commands, never doing any work himself, and returning at sunset to the best and stoutest of last season's nests in the top of a great pine 
above the orchard. Undoubtedly a gangster, Miss Hickory decided after she had watched him every day of old crow week. He ought to be shot, but they'll never catch him. He's too wary. She stayed at home all that week, living on the hoard of her frozen foods. When Sunday came at the end of Old Crow Week, she decided to make a trip to the woods to see if anything was green there. In a short time, Jack in the pulpit might stretch his slender hands up through the mold. She had not heard a sermon all winter. So, Miss Hickory took off her hat, brushed, straightened, and pulled it on again, and was about to step out of her nest and start down boughs when she was completely bowled over. Her nest almost turned upside down with the weight of two great yellow claws perched on its edge. Two wide, rusty black wings spread tentwise above her. A rough, coarse voice cawed. Still here, old nut? How is your sap running after the long winter? It was without doubt, crow. And as Miss Hickory clung to the sides of her nest, trembling, she saw to her horror that Crow, her Crow, who had so kindly found her a home last autumn, was the leader of the old Crow Week celebration. He, it was he who had led the raid on the Ladies' Aid Society, stolen corn, directed the mapping of the cornfields, and now, without doubt, was going to commit murder. But as quickly as he had come, Crow hopped to a nearby branch of the apple tree. His voice softened. Dear lady, pardon the high spirits of the old resident. Uh, I just stopped by to see how you had passed the winter north. The Southland may be all right for birds who take cold easily. I go in that direction to pick cherries and certain kinds of garden stuff that do not ripen here until spring. He rolled his eyes and winked at me. Now that he had removed his heavy weight and her nest had righted itself, the Sickly stood up, indignation in every line of her twigs. New words popped into her head. Scram! Bam moose! she exclaimed shrilly. I am sorry that I ever met you. Thief! Disturber of the peace! Dear lady, so crotchety when spring is in the air. In like a lion, out like a lamb, as they say of March, but between you and me, it's in like a crow out like a bluebird. You don't seem glad to have me back again, and I have just left an important committee meeting to invite you to take flight with me. Flight? The word changed Miss Hickory's rage to excitement in an instant. All her life she had regretted her inexperience in travel. Going away on a bus or a train, she had heard, broadened one's mind. As for taking an airplane, no one in all the years the old place had stood had done that. When? Where's the airport? Who will buy me a ticket? Now, right here at your nest. Nothing to pay. Crow answered all of her questions in one long cough. He came close, lifted Miss Hickory deftly in one claw, turned his head, and dropped her on his broad back. Hold close to my neck, he told her. She did that, clutching with both arms. Crow spread his wings, they arose in a rush of high air, and were off. Crow made harsh but true statements as they flew. The same old nut, judging by your remarks, making no allowances. Suppose I do eat the neighbor's corn. I eat bugs, too. What if I can't sing like a thrush? I am the first bird to spread word of the spring thaws, and I have no hard feelings that I, Starling, English Sparrow, Hawk, and Owl can be shot at whenever they found or found close enough. All right, all right, Crow. She gasped as the bare trees raced along beside them and the brisk wind tossed her words like sparks from a bonfire. Don't try to explain yourself. Just keep on going. So Crow flew in a great wing spread, high, low, round about, here and there, carrying Miss Hickory so steadily that she had not a moment of air sickness. Snow, a foot deep still, whitened the top of Temple Mountain, but at the foot, a rose pink haze lay in lovely color. That was the budding of the red maple trees. In the lee of the mountain, there hung a golden curtain, as pale yellow as a new moon. That was the flowering of the willows. The earth was a checkerboard of farms marked off by their gray stone walls and patterned by brown furrows. Once, as crows swooped down over high mowing, 
she saw some moving spots like bits of scattered broken sunset. Cock Pheasant and the other men have come to collect their wives, Crow explained. They want help in making new nests in the brush pile over the woods, and you'll see every one of the girls will forgive and forget now that mating time has come. Sure enough, Crow was right. As each brilliant cock pheasant left the entrance to the Ladies' Aid Society at a space distance behind him, walked a small drab hen, silent as was befitting, but her heart bursting with happiness. Then up, up flew Crow, until behind the tossing balloons of the March clouds, Miss Hickory could see blue sky. Down, down, to listen to the faint but bright singing of faraway Third Brook, rippling beneath its broken ice. Barn Heifer was out at pasture. Wild Heifer, dragging the rope and post that had tied her to the barnyard, was charging through the woods beside Fawn, both of them big and longer of leg now. Up again and meeting newcomers, a yellow butterfly trying the wings, that had been so lately folded in the blanket of the cocoon. A flock of early song sparrows, some lovelorn chickadees. She felt safe up there among the sunbeams. Miss Hickory was able to fly at last without holding Crow's neck. She stretched her arms wide in delight. Such motion, such earth movies, such promise of things to come. The moss that trimmed her winter garments, now brown and scraggly, blew off, but she let it go without a regret. Her hat also came off and blew away, a pinpoint of green below, then completely gone. Crow, she shouted as they circled finally above her apple tree. I shall make myself some new clothes. Atta girl, he agreed coarsely. I shall clean the house, she said, remembering her busy days of redding up her little corncob house when the lilacs budded. I wouldn't bother, he advised her. Look at me, hale and hearty, and I have never tidied my nest or even washed myself all my life. Well, she thought, do look at yourself. Mud on your feet, dust on your wings, living at a last year's nest instead of a well-built new one. But all this mattered very little, she knew, weighed against Crow's kindness and his courage. I'll be right over young, he told her as they dived and made a safe landing close to her nest in the apple tree. If you need me, just whistle. Spring is early this year. Miss Hickory, with breathless thanks, alighted. Crow spread his wings. Then, a word used frequently in sermons by Jack in the pulpit, came into her head. Glory be, shouted Miss Hickory. Things seem to be going extremely well for Miss Hickory. However, sometimes when things are going well, sometimes things change. What do you think's going to happen next? And now more of Miss Hickory. When Bullfrog set out from his pond for Third Brook late in the autumn, he had a fixed idea in his slow-moving mind. Frog Pond had been his home for years. There, among many others of his family, he spent his summer sounding like kerchunks in a loud, booming voice, his springs bringing up hundreds of his tadpole children and his winters sleeping in the warm mud of the bottom. If anyone had told him that this step he was taking, this long hop, was the beginning of a great adventure, Bullfrog would have rolled his goggle eyes in surprise. He was tired of being a target for stones thrown at him by two-leggers when he came out to sit in the sun on the bank. They even broke the ice to try and torment him. After many years of having stones thrown at him, Bullfrog had decided to look for a new home. Frog Pond, green with rushes and noisy with its croaking inhabitants, lay close to the old place. The bottom, thick with mud and a jungle of water weeds, was a paradise for frogs. Croak, kerchunk, boom, boom. They made as much noise as a swing band, and Bullfrog, a fat, bespeckled old fellow, was the loudest bass of all. He was tougher and louder each season, a frog to be reckoned with as he sat on a little rostrum made of tin cans that had been thrown into the frog pond and pleasantly shaded by water plants. His eyes bulged out like marbles and a suit of rough green skin with big humpy spots was so thick that it is questionable whether a stone would have even scratched it. But Bullfrog, for time without end, had heard the say, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Surely a glass house would be safer 
he had tried to set that proverb to croaks, hoped to be able to boom it out from beyond the pond, but it had been beyond his powers. So after many years in early autumn, Bullfrog had started out, regardless of wind and weather, of the future or of anything except that a hop at a time he was leaving Frog Pond behind in his search for a safer home, for a place where there were glass houses. We'll find out what happens to this frog and Miss Hickory and others as Miss Hickory continues. <laughs>